to him who loved us and washed us from our sins by his blood and made us kings and priests to God the Father. To him be all glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The sermon text for today and almost every Sunday in this short epiphany season is from 1 Corinthians. Today you heard chapter 6. And the messages we get from it will be a total of three readings are really most practical for your life in the gospel, following Jesus, and with others. It's a big theme of this epistle of Paul's. And today's sermon title is indeed the spiritual body. Now, in his name, what Christ is sharing here through the apostle may, may not be what you think. He does talk here to the people in Corinth and to us about their individual physical bodies and specifically about their sexual activity. And he does tell them there is something spiritual about the way we use our body, whether it's sexually or otherwise. But the Apostle Paul, I think, at the end expands the message quite a bit. And, and I, I can do it even here, anticipating the sermon a little bit in, in two weeks. Maybe I should have saved this till then. But I could illustrate simply by holding this up and saying, I think, ah, I think a beer would be good at the start of the sermon today. Now I'm looking across the congregation and we don't have any Baptist visitors. I do want to be sensitive to them and not make light of, of their heartfelt belief that one should avoid all alcoholic beverages. That's not what we see in Scripture. Drunkenness is forbidden by God, but the Psalms also say that God makes wine that gladdens man's heart. There is a purpose for it, even medicinally, Paul wrote to Timothy. But to do that, to actually open this beer bottle and take a drink, although we Lutherans say nothing wrong with it outwardly, it's not illegal, disobeying the governing authorities, it's not against Scripture, it is addressed here. In 1 Corinthians 6, we'll hear it in two weeks also from 1 Corinthians 8. There is a spiritual body. Now, it does involve, you can't miss this here, sexual morality. What we do sexually or with anything bodily is spiritual. One problem Paul has to address, we still have the fallout in our culture, is this Western idea that there are things spiritual and things material. And the things spiritual are what matter to God. The things material well, I can do what I want with those. That dichotomy is not the truth of God. In fact, I don't think, at least most often in Scripture, the definition of spiritual equals non-physical. A good definition of spiritual Spiritual, especially in the New Testament, a good synonym might be godly, connected to God, spiritual. And that involves things non-physical, 
your soul, your invisible life force within you, and your body. And that's why Paul emphasizes even the sexual activity of a body is important to God. Did you notice that he refers here to Christ's body? God raised the Lord, his body, and will raise us by his power. The work of salvation involves not only your soul, but also your body, indeed, in the resurrection. And Paul will actually say to the people, they were denying that too, in chapter 15, we have in glory spiritual bodies. Bodies that are just what God wants. Perfect. And so what we do with our imperfect bodies here on earth and material things is important. Indeed, to God and to you, and to others. It involves church things too. A distinction I haven't heard said, I believe, erroneously much here at St. Paul Lutheran Church, but it's in this congregation a bit too. The Board of Elders takes care of the spiritual things and the Board of Trustees takes care of the non-spiritual things. I've talked with Carl, and I've talked with the church president overseeing earthly affairs, encouraging them to see that what they're doing is spiritual. It involves our money, our time, and our outward relations. That's the big topic here today. And actually, trying to keep things short, especially with installations today and Holy Communion in the second service, one simple point can be made to intrigue you to pray about this more. I didn't discover this until a few years into being a pastor, and I don't often like to cite the Greek original language, but it's really, really, really important here. In verses 19 and 20, the word your, the, the possessive pronoun, is plural. Paul's talking here about more than just you individually. I've said before, we can do it here in Texas, although English doesn't have a plural pronoun you. We've got it here, y'all. Let me read it that way. Paul emphasizes here, if I can turn to the page, do you not know that the body of y'all is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own, for y'all were bought with a price. So glorify God in the body of y'all. Body is singular. But you is plural. We have together one body. And what we do, especially outwardly, because that's all we can really know of each other, is important and crucial. There's a phrase here used when this especially is a confirmation verse. Maybe for somebody here. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. That's the key. All of us were bought with the precious blood of Christ. Together. All our sins confessed. All our sins forgiven by him who died on the cross to pay for them. And this body with all our individual bodies redeemed for his purposes. In 1 Corinthians 12, which we won't hear this epiphany season, 
the apostle emphasizes that we are one body with many parts. And what the hand does affects the foot, the eyes, the ears. We can't separate ourselves one from another. And so what we do outwardly is first redeemed by God, glorified by Him, and used for His purposes. The redemption of Christ. We celebrate every Sunday, every day, every moment of our baptized lives. Binds us together indeed in, in the redemption of our individual souls and body as one body in Christ. So y'all, <laughs> glorify God in your body. Amen.